So I, I'm here today to talk about um, uh, something I've been calling evidence-based design. And that's what I'd like to share with you today um, as, as we go through the next half an hour, um, where I'll have a lot of data and, um, and some philosophy. It's a talk in five sections. OK, so the first section is about evidence. And the tenth section of his philosophical essays concerning human understanding, published in 1748, David Hume discussed the phenomenon of miracles. In the essay, he famously debated about the power of evidence, what it is and what it isn't, starting with, how do we know miracles exist? He then goes on to critique an over-reliance on subjective witnesses, eyewitnesses, spectators, and testimonies, for our experience often knits together a story when there is none. By the way, he does not directly debunk miracles, but he's just asking for more evidence which is kind of nice. This is me at my birthday party playing res. Um, as he says, we are the gazing populace receiving greedily without examination whatever soothes superstition and promotes wonder. This is 1748. I think we are all guilty in good ways and bad of having a fascination with wonder. This is an, a an age old part of the human condition obviously um, and it's also something very special, some something that makes us fall in love and make art among other things. But we do have to take it um, with a little bit of analysis. Arguing that an individual human experience is only part of any given mass perspective, Hume's thinking is that evidence has to be multiplied. Such recognition in what we now call science emerged during the Enlightenment and has stayed with us. Now, science may be a kind of belief, and, <laughs> as it's been called, um, and may be believed. And yes, it certainly contains a perspective with its own needs and embedded biases, etc. Yet science is also something that is testable by others and needs the same outcomes to remain believed. Science has to be repeatable, reproducible, verified. And it is the result of our mass observations and tests and measurements all rolled into one. So Hume was very interested in this idea of of wisdom saying, um, a wise man proportions his belief on the evidence. And evidence is just as interesting a concept when it comes to games in our Games for Change community. I ran into the link between games and evidence almost a decade ago, not from crime shows and or philosophers at that point, um, but among the medical community. In my lab, we were making games to expose people to pro-social ideas about public health, helping regular people determine what hospital to, to go to, um, what kind of vaccination to have, etc. And so working with teams of physicians was really enlightening to me. Most of the doctors and public health practitioners I worked with were ascribers to evidence-based medicine. And I think we can learn a lot from evidence-based medicine, actually. Evidence-based medicine, as David Sackett and his colleagues wrote in 1996, is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And the phrase first appeared in an article in the Rational Clinical Examination series uh, in JAMA in 1992, but its roots go back to the 1950s. Tom Chalmers created a 1955 report of a randomized factorial trial of bed rest and diet for um, treatment of hepatitis. And he didn't just look at patients like an expert would. He also looked at, and he didn't just look at patients in terms of his education and his textbook uh, upbringing and, 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 his, um, and his degree, he looked, he looked at randomized trials. He looked at the evidence outside of his experience as well as his experience with the patient. And that's something that um, uh, uh, seems to be a, a, a new thing in the 1950s, using meta-analysis of research, combining research, and looking across international divides for solutions to medical challenges. So this approach, tying research um, and beyond one patient data sets to one's practice, to one's expertise, was, was really a, a foundational moment in the creation of evidence-based tools and really in, has been inspiring to me. And of course, this, this work from the 1950s um, changed the treatment plan for his patient, for Chalmers' patient, and it also forever, he says, changed his attitude towards conventional wisdom uncovering his latent iconoclasm and inaugurated in his career what he called clinical epidemiology. So why I think this story is really important is that everyone in this room believes games have impact of some kind, but I would argue that we're still quite fuzzy about what we mean by impact. 
much like doctors in the 1950s were fuzzy in certain ways about what kind of evidence they were using to diagnose and uh, solve what kinds of medical problems. How do we determine if a game has impact, or, how, or rather, how can a game's impact be better understood? The question for the day. Good question. By the number of players, by media buzz, by laying out certain learning objectives, or do we have to dig deeper, look critically, and find empirical evidence for efficacy? We're only at the beginning of understanding evidence about any kind of systemic impact of games, how particular approaches work better than, better than others or even do harm. And the kinds of evidence I think we collect is really key. So there's shifts in attitudes and beliefs, there's shifts in learning, there's shifts in behaviors and actions, there's shifts in even physical manifestations or physical outcomes. So we also need to measure these shifts in repeatable, methodologically strong ways. We need to measure over time if possible. Obviously, longitudinal data collection from players beats one-off data and in some ways has been the holy grail of a lot of the research in, in social sciences when applied to the game space. So these are all areas that I'm really uh, interested in looking at. So today I'm going to briefly run down four different studies that, um, that three of which you, you have not seen as a community. Well, maybe I, I'm going to talk a little bit about MindFlock from yesterday. Um, two, uh, several years ago, um, I gave a talk at Games for Change and talked about this game, Buffalo, um, and, um, and, and, and Buffalo's impact. Now, some of you may have remembered uh, Buffalo when um, it's a card game. You, it has uh, two different cards that pop up, and you have two different criteria, a, a, a noun and a an adjective, and you're supposed to name a person living or dead who matches the criteria on the card. Um, in this game, um, uh, after a, a play session, we had some really interesting findings. We uh, did controlled experiments with this game, and we found that um, the game actually increased two psychological measures related to open-mindedness. Um, the results show a statistically significant rise in the recognition of complex social identities and higher marks on the average universal orientation schedule, which is a measure of non-prejudice generally used um, by social psychologists. So I like to think of this game short-circuiting the way our, our brains make stereotypes by, by offering counter-stereotypical examples, and that kind of subconscious process is actually backed by some of the um, uh, conversations that, that players have after they play the game. Um, and and when, I, when I think about using games in this way, I think about them as micro-solutions to microaggressions uh, as they uh, can be played over and over and are small. You know, they're not, not everyone, um, they're, 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 they're popping up in social groups, they're popping up in social situations, and that makes them um, quite interesting. Uh, as, a, as, as interventions. So this is, this is just something as a review that, uh, that really did show some, some, some promise. Um, I know Constance Steinkuller mentioned yesterday some of this uh, work that we've done in relationship to women and STEM and, 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 and biases. Um, uh, I want to also talk about a game that we worked on um, called Replay Health. This is a very different kind of game. This was a game to take a, tech, a very uh, reality-based digital simulation tool developed by the Ripple Foundation and MIT and take the data that everyone is uh, using. It's actually real-time, real-world data, like let's look at the budget of Pueblo, Colorado, and then if we move these widgets and these kinds of things, we increase uh, uh, you know, doctors and we, uh, we decrease uh, this kind of policy. How can, how can we actually affect um, healthcare quality, healthcare spending, and, and, and group health, uh, environmental health for an entire region. So people are making these really big simulations. You have to be in a room all day with a facilitator. They're really useful tools for speculative thinking. Um, and and um, the Ripple Foundation wanted to make a game about this. And you know, the first instinct for a lot of groups is to say, well, just, this should be like The Sims, right? Like, oh, we should think about the, all of these bells and widgets like The Sims. But more and more, we know from psychological research that evidence alone doesn't necessarily shift, mind, shift minds and behaviors, and we're living in a particular time where that's especially true. So what do we think about? when we think about um, uh, creating a kind of healthy community. So what we did instead is we had, a, we, we created a role-playing game where you actually, it's like a role-playing sport, 
And it immerses players in a fictional world where they take on unique characters with distinct personas who face specific behavioral and environmental health risk factors. And by modeling the impact of declining health in a community on individual level livelihood and community level productivity, it inspires shifts, well, we hoped that it would inspire shifts in players' thinking. So the next thing we had to do, of course, was measure what happened. And so this is kind of inter interesting stuff. Um, this is a study when we did an initial randomized controlled study um, that demonstrated the, the, that the game was successful at pl uh, participants randomly assigned uh, to experience the game as active players. So what we did here is actually look at who's playing the game versus watching the game. And this has informed a lot of uh, our, our current design work, actually, uh, that those assigned um, as active players compared to those assigned to be passive spectators reported significantly greater movement from pretest to post-test in their subjective rankings of several healthcare policies and exhibited a higher likelihood of identifying situational or systemic factors as contributors to unhealthy behavior. So they kind of, they, the, actually playing the game was a very different piece of data than watching the game being played, and they were shifts in these categories. Now, it, it's, and this was over a two-week period, so we actually followed up um, two weeks after playing the game. And so we're trying to get further um, longitudinal work um, happening at, at my lab, Tilt Factor, um, here we have uh, a game, uh, we, we developed two games actually in um, uh, work on bystander intervention. Yesterday during the pitch session I talked about MindFlock, which is a trivia game. Um, and our, uh, our mission was to develop uh, a, a, a video game or a suite of video games that actually are delivered to first year students um, to increase bystander intervention behaviors. Um, this is the first conference, by the way, I'm actually talking about this, this project. It's been going on for about a year and a half, two years, um, and we're, we're finally allowed to talk about it because we stopped collecting data on round one. Um, so what's interesting is that, so in this particular project here, we have MindFlock, which is a trivia game. It looks uh, like a trivia crack type of thing, and you're, you're playing it. And um, I'll talk about the data in a little bit, comparing it with, uh, alongside the second component of this, of this bystander intervention project that we did with prevention innovations. Um, and it is uh, called um, Ship Happens. And it's basically a day in the life of college students, they, but they're actually in the future and they're aliens. <laughs> so they go, <laughs> so they, they, so you, you're seeing an example here of a, uh, a kind of, a kind of alien convenience store <laughs> where, um, where a girl is kind of getting stalked by a, by a, 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 a someone in a relationship stalking and uh, is given advice by the character or you can choose to give advice to the character. So we went with a kind of quasi Scott Pilgrim attitude, um, uh, interactive comic and this is played by first year students and the orientation, um, uh, orientation of, uh, of university. And you can see different um, things that happen. Um, so this is, this is the, the character can choose, you can choose as a player to give someone um, some information on who to call or something like that. Most of the um, material, of course, is about going to barbecues and buying pizza and doing other kinds of college things that have nothing to do with um, uh, bystander intervention or sexual assault. So, um, Here's a, one more slide, yeah. So you see these guys having an interaction. So that ship happens. So we, we studied two, um, two ways of understanding um, bystander intervention through this scale that's called the bystander efficacy composite. And you can see that um, what happens here is that the control condition, well first I, I'll just tell you a little bit about the study. It's a four week study that included over 250 participants. So both games were targeted towards uh, male first-year college students. So the pretest was administered, and then after playing the game, there was a gap of over a month, and the team revisited the students. The bystander efficacy measures went up on a 10-point scale, as you can see, and, um, and the, that by, bystander efficacy is how comfortable participants would feel if asked to intervene or reflect on their own abilities to jump into a challenging situation. And, you know, a month may feel to a regular person like not a long time for sustained social change, right? Like they're like, wow, a month. But in fact, a month gap uh, between a game intervention and a game's impact has likely been done very, very few times, I think, um, in, in the overall Games for Change community and even in psychological uh, studies, a, a lot of the times the study is uh, immediately after an intervention 
it becomes much harder to retain participants, it becomes much harder to track where people go, and design a study so that it's fair, they don't learn about the intent of the study and all of these kinds of um, uh, 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 things to keep the studies rigorous. So, so we, were, we were really happy with these um, initial results, and the next study is, of course, to see how this could go across a whole year or an entire uh, student's life uh, through a four-year college curriculum would be uh, an ideal way to think about this. So now I'm going to move on to another topic entirely because um, we uh, have a lot to, a lot of kinds of uh, social issues that we, we deal with. This, I, and I know uh, Colleen mentioned uh, Cards Against Humanity earlier. <laughs> it seems to be a hot thing to talk about. So we, we decided to take Cards Against Humanity and um, create our own version called Cops Arrest Manatees. <laughs> and Cops Arrest Manatees, <laughs> Um, is uh, where we first started trying to really get, a, get away with doing behavioral measures in a study. So uh, we worked with climate change scientists to make a game to impact sustainable behaviors. So we employed uh, off-color humor, and um, uh, uh, that's one way to talk about it, <laughs> to see if, uh, this, is, to see if uh, this would affect sustainable behaviors. So they played, uh, participants played a modified version of uh, Cards Against Humanity that we made uh, that either that had some cards related to um, climate change. So for example, here are some cards you might see. There are you know, the tears of penguins drowning in the, Arc in, uh, the Antarctic. Um, this was vetted by a man who runs the Fulbright uh, Arctic program and the, <laughs> and the uh, Arctic Studies Institute at Dartmouth. So we, we, do have a, we do have scientists collaborating going, oh gosh. <laughs> They're worried, but they, they go along with it and just to see what happens here. Um, so each game set contained 118 white answer cards, and in the climate change condition set, which is a separate set, 35% um, of the cards related in some ways to reminding about climate change, okay? So <laughs> we also did this behavioral measure. We, we, we had people fill out questionnaires about their attitudes towards the environment and sustainable behavior, and they also were given a chip that said, when we said that we would donate five dollars or a, a, a piece, a portion of five dollars to a charity, that was another measure. And then we also, when people were doing the studies, everybody got a plastic drinking cup. Now, okay, we've been doing a lot of ARGs and stuff in our lab and designing some really funny things. So we we actually used invisible ink on every cup that was given to every participant. And every participant's number was assigned to every cup. And we were able to track every single cup. We had to go through the garbage. And we had to track every single cup <laughs> that, were, uh, that was thrown away and or recycled. So there's good news and bad news. <laughs> bad news first, people just don't recycle. <laughs> Only 10% of the participants in the control condition recycled. This is a very low return, um, uh, especially if you saw this, this trash, these, I mean, they, these were the labels on the trash cans, like this was a very, you know, it's, there, and there's only one way out of this place that we, we did the study, and, and that was a very sad, um, sad realization that, that um, participants really didn't actually recycle in general. But you see in the climate change condition, we actually have a much higher percentage of people, um, of people actually recycling. Now what's very interesting to me, and something we haven't figured out further, is the attitudes didn't necessarily change, but the behavior changed in this particular study. So that was also something. Often you can measure attitude change, and you know you can get to the holy grail of getting behavior change. Here we have behavior change, but attitude change didn't show um, measurable uh, results. So that's pretty wild, and to be continued. Okay, so how do we? <laughs> so enough data. That's a lot of data. I just dumped a ton of data on your heads. I'm sorry, but. <laughs> What I'm really interested here and now is talking with you is, okay, well, how do you actually think about this evidence? How are you getting these projects together? And what's the life cycle of a project like this? I wanna talk a little bit about this idea that we have called embedded design. So embedded design is a set of approaches we've developed at Tilt Factor that offer these evidence-based strategies for including persuasive content into systems in ways that circumvent player psychological uh, defenses, and they trigger a more receptive mindset for internalizing a game's intended message. So, and, and to, you have to do this without sacrificing, of course, the player's um, desire to play. So, um, so, so, for example, we have this idea of intermixing, which is mixing on-topic and off-topic content. That would be, for example, 
um, the Cards Against Humanity mod, where we where we looked at a very uh, we had we we mixed content so that you, as you're playing, you can't you, it doesn't mean you can actually tell that the game. You, in fact, that will actually ruin it. And we have data that suggests as soon as you know um, uh, the game's intention, uh, you uh, the results immediately drop off, and you can actually do uh, reversal of, of of the way in which uh, players take your message. So 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 there's obfuscating, for example, which is um, a way that you take an off-topic theme, like trivia. It's a trivia game, mind flock. It has nothing to do with bystander intervention, sexual assault, or whatever, and you just, you just work on the off-topic theme and make, um, using uh, kind of psychological approaches within that to kind of uh, dissuade the user or the player from really uh, kind of having that psychological reaction of, oh, they're trying to tell me what to think. Um, intermixing is, uh, is uh, just to, to unpack that a little. We've done some unpacking about how much content is too much content. Sometimes we'll load a deck with 65%, 100%, 85% of the topic content. And we have found, we have found that between a quarter and a fifth of the content um, can be related to the topic, but as soon as you start to get over that, you can actually produce negative results. And over 50%, uh, players know what you're doing right away, and they, they um, you know, I'll be honest, they hate you. Okay, <laughs> so then, <laughs> so then we have things like um, uh, dis psychological distancing. So, for example, you make a public health game, but then you make a public health game about zombies. So you can literally think of psychological distance. Oh, you're very different than me, or physical distance. Uh, it's around the world. It's a fantasy land. So using fiction is a really powerful tool that we found works, and also something called delayed reveal is another technique that we found works, which is when you start off. Um, a start off a, 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 a story or something and you don't actually know that you're playing as a, as, a, as a particular kind of character from a marginalized group or a dominant group or whatever, keeping things ambiguous for a while and then revealing um, the, the subject position of characters, for example, helps people bond with the character in their mind. If you, if you, if you, if you immediately introduce a character um, who is uh, different than the intended audience, it's sometimes hard for uh, people to uh, connect with those if they're like there's called in-group and out-group um, and it's not about correctness it's about self-perception um, so the, these are all psychologically um, documented and we use a lot of this work in our papers so you can go and find all of these references if you're really curious about the bodies of literature on psychological distance on delayed reveal and um, experience taking and this kind of stuff but we use these in, in, in combination to start to put together pieces where we can, we can see if there's impact and see if there's change. And I want to just show you a development cycle. Hopefully this isn't frightening to you and it's exciting. It's exciting to me. Um, so you have this normal game development cycle in the middle of the screen here, but every time we do something in the lab, we're doing it informed by the outer circle and activated by the outer circle. So we've got, we, ha we start with theories in the idea stage, um, we get, we're, we're working with subject matter experts and psychologists to see if the prototype is actually manifesting, but that's still not necessarily evidence. The evidence really comes when we're formally doing the studies. And if there, any change has to happen when we're formally doing the studies, we actually have to go back and then um, modify the game and then modify the study. And that, this is where it gets very, very um, challenging um, if, if you're uh, on the road in your project life cycle. So, yeah, it's a lot. So I was asked by Naomi Clark, <laughs> why, does it, don't, why don't more people do this evidence-based design? And I, I have to just say, I, I, I think perhaps we have, um, we have four possible guesses here that I could come up with. Maybe we just expect from our own learning to see interventions as looking like interventions. So maybe it's too novel. Maybe, maybe this stuff is, looks too weird. I, I get a lot of reactions to that. When we made a zombie game for a bunch of physicians and I tried to get them to dress up in 16th century outfits and do a plague game, they, you know, they, they thought that the leeches went too far. And I, I you know, I, I, I didn't. <laughs> Um, convention, you know, is it just convention keeping us more clever? Well, an educational game looks like this. You know, I have, I've been doing a lot of research on, on 19th century educational board games, and you know what? They were not fun then. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> really bad. Like the loser had to, anyway, I'll just, offline, <laughs> offline. Um, so uh, cost, this is very expensive stuff to do. 
um, in terms of getting the expertise and getting the people. That doesn't mean that you can't involve students. It doesn't mean that you can't involve uh, collaborations. And those are ways to cut that ex expense. And then expertise. You know, is it a fear of empiricism? Oh, don't bring your data near my art. Uh, uh, you know, is it one of those kinds of things? That is disciplinary studies that that uh, that are keeping us from doing these things? These are these are open questions. I'm, I'm encouraging us all to consider them and think about them. Um, quickly on four failure. Um, our best intentions that look uh, effective uh, and start dialogue and meet critical success can often not work or can unintentionally backfire. Uh, I, I really, uh, you know, about 30% of the games that we develop prototypes, uh, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna get, uh, this is gonna be a, a game to encourage girls in spatial reasoning, you know, no. It did not. <laughs> no, it did not. Um, at least it didn't do harm, but it made no one happy about spatial reasoning, even though it was a fun game. And we could have commercialized this game, and people would buy it, and it still doesn't help people do spatial reasoning, so that would be unethical. So we're not, so, so games fail, and it's, you have to get to a point where you see the failure and you can try something else. Uh, we can't just kind of keep convincing ourselves that this approach works, because they don't all work, and I see it over and over in my lab. And you know it could work in other ways that we don't have tools to measure yet. But that I, I'm willing to just try to try to measure things and that I can have some control over. And you know we know from studies that um, games that seem to address a problem successfully can fail. In 2016, Russo's and Davidio studied the game spend and attitudes and beliefs about the poor. And you know uh, they did in find, in fact, that there was more uh, empathetic concern and the game can increase empathy. But it did not. Pro it, it it did not actually. Um, uh, researchers found that because playing a game about poverty and thus having control over one's outcomes led participants to believe poverty is personally controllable. Um, and it did not positively influence attitudes towards the poor. So yes, it led to empathy. No, it didn't change attitudes. So let us use the word empathy. Let us never use the word empathy maybe for a, a, a decade and see what happens. Okay, so to close my talk today. <laughs> I, I want to provide a huge caveat to this focus on evidence, uh, you know, my maniacal focus on evidence today, and that is, you know, there, there is an argument to be made for making art. I'm an artist. Um, I, I, I make art uh, all the time. These are some artworks I make. Um, and I'm not saying that everything needs to, n humans produce needs to be quantified and measured. I'm not, I'm not of, that, of that place. Uh, nor am I saying that we should only work in empirically validated ways. After all, you know, if I'm an artist, artists want to make things that please them or trouble them, provoke. Um, and I did start this talk uh, with a philosopher whose kinds of evidence might be very different than the kinds of evidence I've given you today. But in making something creative, in response to something, in response to something, something critical of something, and reflective, is vastly different exercise, at least for me, than claiming something changes the status quo, or changes people, or increases, or enhances learning. Like these, these are when, when we start to make instrumental claims is when I, uh, I get very worried and I really would like to see more of Hume and anti-intellectualism. More, <laughs> more of Hume and less of anti-intellectualism. So, you know, art brings much to our lives and is desperately needed now more than ever, um, but we need to look at our processes with a critical eye and leave room for failure. Someone said this word yesterday and I had it in my talk as well. Um, let, let us not be guilty of producing bad medicine or snake oil, right? Something that appears positive but really isn't. And, and, and everything has an impact. We just need to know what it is. So this conference is filled with astute talks and aspiring projects, and I'm honored to be among the people who are really digging into this stuff and, 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 and getting into it. And I hope this talk today inspires you to push the connections among traditionally disparate disciplines, philosophy, social science, design, play, and more as you, as you uh, uh, seek truths from the work that you're doing. Thank you.